Hello, everybody. I'm Alicia Wallace. I'm from the Bahamas. I'm a women's human rights defender, and I also run an organization called Equality Bahamas, which promotes women's rights as human rights. And we regularly um, support vulnerable communities and marginalized communities, including LGBT people, people experiencing poverty, migrants, um, and ethnic minorities. I'll throw it over to Izzy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Izzy. Um, I run an organization called Foundervine, and Foundervine is a UK-based social enterprise that helps uh, young people start businesses and grow businesses. Um, and we were started in 2018 um, in response to the challenges that we saw in um, young people getting access to the enterprise education they needed to learn about that kind of stuff, um, and also to start businesses when they were ready. Um, so really passionate about getting more women and people from ethnic minority backgrounds in the UK um, into entrepreneurship and technology. Um, and I'm based in Accra, Ghana. Over to you, Mike. Well, thank you very much, Izzy. Uh, hey, folks. Uh, my name is Mike Omani, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Commonsense Network. We are an independent uh, online news network. And what we do is create uh, online spaces and offline spaces for people who disagree with each other, people from different political political cleavages to come together and learn from each other. So we, we combat, and I guess my passion is combat in polarization, but also access, giving people who've been locked out of politics, journalism, a chance to, to, to get in. Um, it's been a great three year journey. We're three years old and I'm looking forward to this amazing event put on by the Queen's Commonwealth Trust. Um, we know that there's been a lot going on all over the world. Um, everyone's eyes are on the US and the protests that are taking place there. Um, and of course, on the side of that, there are some looting and riots, but that's not really the focus or where anybody's attention or energy should be. And it's really sparked a lot of conversation all over the world, specifically about race, about racism and about systems and what we need to do to change systems. Um, and what it takes to actually inspire people to consider some of these tough topics and how to learn more. Um, I think for people on pretty much every side of this issue, there's a need for more information and there's a need for resources and different types of resources. So sometimes you need a book to learn more about what anti-racism looks like. Because um, we know there's a difference between not being racist, but being specifically anti-racist and then being specifically pro-black. So how do you learn the differences between these things that there are articles sometimes? Um, sometimes for those of us who are um, black or identify as part of the African diaspora, it's important to have resources that actually help us to take care of ourselves. We kind of get bogged down a lot of the time in just trying to do the work, trying to answer questions, posting on social media constantly, and need to be reminded that we need to take a break. Um, where do we find the resources that will help us to be able to self-reflect, be able to connect with our communities, um, take a break, maybe have a little yoga session, um, how to journal. Sometimes people suggest journaling, but you don't really know how to journal. Um, so we really want to invite you to share any resources that you have found helpful, particularly over the past few days. Um, you can just drop those links into the chat throughout. So if any come to mind right away, please look them up and drop the links in the chat. But if others come to your mind throughout the conversation, drop them in there. And our tech team is also kind of an admin team and they'll make sure that they get added to a Google Doc that we've created that you can drop um, these resources in later on. Um, so just inviting you to think about some resources. They could be books, they could be articles, it could be a podcast that's really good about talking about some of these issues. I am gonna share two resources that I actually did myself. And this is something that I'm gonna to recommend to you. If you think of something that is needed that isn't out there yet, feel free to create it, um, especially something that's particularly for your community or for your online audience. So one of the things that I did over the weekend, I realized that we were having really difficult conversations in the Bahamas. There were a lot of young people disagreeing about whether or not racism exists here because we're a majority black country. And I realized that a lot of the tension, a lot of the arguments were coming from just lack of information and nuance to the conversation. So I decided to create a thread that kind of broke down what racism is and what it looks like specifically here and then what we can do about it. Um, I'll also share another thread that I started that is just for white people, um, because as we know, 
people need information and then they go to the experts and of course black people are the experts on blackness but we're also exhausted and already doing a lot of work and don't really have time to educate people uh, so i did a thread that's just for white people about what you can be doing right now and some resources that could be helpful um, so i hope that you will start i see people have started dropping some stuff yes awesome so keep that up throughout the conversation and at this point i'm going to throw it over to mike who's going to take us into the next segment superb um thank you so much alicia um so you know it's, it's very very clear uh, if you look in, in, in the mainstream media, there's there's quite a few competing narratives going on. I think whether you look at the global media, the US media, or in my context, the UK media, there seems to be a lot of thought about, you know, how people should be acting at this time. So uh, we all saw uh, on our Instagram feeds, uh, black squares. I mean, in the UK, we definitely saw it. It might have been a worldwide phenomenon where people posted black squares on Tuesday uh, in solidarity uh, to the Black Lives Matter movement, but also to try and draw attention to the music industries, um, I guess, profiteering off of black talent without proper recognition uh, 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 and compensation. But then, then a few days later, we saw a backlash to that. People saying, hold on, you can't just post a black square. You've got to actually give money or you've got to actually do this. You know, and so you've got all these competing narrative, uh, narratives about how we should be acting. And in this segment, I thought it might be good to open up the conversation a bit to, to ask uh, young leaders across uh, the Commonwealth. Now, how should we be acting at this time? H how are you acting? Uh, uh, you know, sh should we be taking time off social media to protect our mental health, or, or should we be uh, really uh, uh, speaking up right now? I, I would love to hear some personal experiences, but also anyone who has any thoughts as to how they think uh, leaders ought to be behaving and acting and responding to this, especially publicly. Um, that would be great. So I, I imagine if you want to speak, you can wave your hand. And I think uh, someone from the tech team um, can probably uh, pick you to speak. Am I correct in saying that? My name is Sarah and I'm the founder of IGEA Enterprise. So we look at breaking period poverty um, for girls in rural communities in Ghana. I'm currently based in the UK. Um, I'm currently um, in the position that everybody, like black squares are good but everybody should also be able to do what they can. So I think posting a black square um, and you doing that on your Instagram, maybe that's the, your way of speaking out, but doing something like signing a petition or giving money, I think it should be what someone can do within their means. And I think one thing about social media, sometimes it can be a bit performative. People trying to be like, okay, yeah, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, but do what you can. Like some people, they don't have to post it online to show that actually I'm reading it, I'm gonna have a chat with my family or my friends, educating them about race and about you know being anti-racist um, and what that looks like so I think it's about being able to have that balance on doing what you can and real realizing that everybody is in their own journey with understanding race and being anti-racist which I think is a long journey that we've got to go on so people starting is a good place excellent I'm in, I'm in total agreement feel free to speak uh, G uh, hi, I'm G and I work in Uganda with EcoBrick, where we are working with vulnerable communities to help solve the issue of plastic pollution. Um, I have been really overwhelmed, really confused, been getting quite paranoid as well about what I should share and what I shouldn't. And I really want to be an active part of the conversation, but I don't want to offend at the same time. And I'm very conscious as a white person in particular, things can be misconstrued, particularly on social media, where everything is so instantaneous. Um, and I've had that already. And some people have said to me, look, you are the worst type of white because you think you have some level of awareness and you have none. So I decided to, um, I think the big thing about the Blackout Tuesday was that there's going to be all of this noise and everyone is going to be really active for say a week and then everything will die down again. So I've decided that I'm going to post every day a picture or an image of a black artist or a black activist um, to give them the voice to help amplify their voice for the rest of June and then after the end of June I'll see what happens. Um, so for me very much as a white person at the minute, it's about listening and trying to raise the voices of black people as opposed to putting my view across because I think that's where the paranoia and confusion comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else want, anyone else want to share? 
Um, I guess uh, generally I've been feeling, um, I guess indifferent about how to approach these kinds of, um, I guess not just conversations, but um, I guess whenever there's like an uprising such as this one. Uh, and so my general demeanor and role uh, within the context of social justice has been um, very uh, behind the scenes and I guess uh, very rudimentary towards uh, what I'm able to do personally based on my skill set. Uh, so for context, um, I happen to run a tech nonprofit that teaches um, youth in the Caribbean and by extension underrepresented um, populations how to code. Uh, and so um, within that work, a uh, majority of the things that I do have to uh, are geared towards like economic empowerment uh, and more or less um, upskilling young people so that they can be competitive with uh, those from the global north. Um, and so uh, that's, that's essentially what like, I'm passionate about um, and what like, I strive to do within the social justice space um, because it, it feels it feels more right to me. Um, and I guess when, when I saw the, I, I, I guess the influx of like, you know, the, the black squares for instance, or just any sort of, um, any sort of initiative geared towards like the front, forefront, um, such as like related to social media, uh, it kind of sparked or I guess triggered some, uh, something within, I guess, my psyche. I've had people, uh, I guess, just question um, the things that I'm probably doing to contribute to the space. Uh, and so it sometimes feels very micromanaging uh, to some extent. Uh, if you have others who uh, are probably, uh, I guess, at the forefront doing, uh, probably doing performative social media things in the moment uh, and kind of questioning what you are already doing in the space. Um, and so, yeah, there's just a general unease there. I'm very uncomfortable with, uh, I guess, the micromanagement of uh, advocacy. Nandini, do you, you want to have, have a pop? Hi, yes, thanks. Um, so hi, I'm Nandini. I run a nonprofit in Botswana that works towards educating children in rural villages. And I think for me, this time has been especially a time of introspection, because I think there's been a lot of talk about how people of color who are not black um, can be allies, but also like introspect on like the own, like our own racism, both towards black people, but as well as like our history, both of colonialism and the caste system and how racism and colorism is so intrinsic in our societies. And so I think, and I also, I'm, I'm co-running a, a South Asian initiative as well. And I think something that we've been struggling with right now is figuring out how do we um, keep the Black Lives Matter movement at the forefront of what we're like, how we're supporting our allyship while also recognizing that the community who's, who we're talking to are South Asians. And this is a time both for them to reflect on their anti-Black history and sentiments, but also um, about how racism is playing out in our own context in many ways. And so there have been lots of questions raised as that if we're trying to contextualize this in our setting, are we taking away from the movement or should we, uh, or should we just be focusing on Black Lives Matter in the US solely? So I think that's something that we've been grappling with and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Amazing, I've got that, I'll respond, but let's just go to Bucky B. Hi everyone, um, my name is Buki. I work um, in an organization focused on sickle cell awareness and um, raising um, awareness for young people to donate blood. Um, for me, I actually have, as a black person, I don't feel the need to actually talk about this particular movement. Um, and I feel like as leaders, we all shouldn't feel obliged to just because, so if I, if I use my example for um, over the last, um, few weeks we've been dealing with COVID-19 in, in Nigeria where my organization is based and trying to provide support for people living with sickle cell and trying to deal with the challenges of, of um, like severely declining you know blood stock and people dealing with um, not being able to go donate blood because of restrictions and things like that so we have quite a lot going on 
and so I think that there's, there feels like for, for, for young leaders, especially like us and people running organizations, there feels like an obligation to talk about every single issue. And it's okay not to want to engage with this issue. And I think for some of the leaders that have also expressed concern about, oh, should I, um, you know, would, would it be sort of racist if I'm talking about this, but I'm not actually black or, you know, how can I do it? It's okay not to engage with this particular movement. I feel like as leaders, um, there's often this pressure that we put on ourselves to comment on every single issue. And the truth is that there's so many issues in the world that we can't, um, like we, we talk about this in, in Queens Young Leaders quite a bit, is that, you know, as leaders, especially people that are quite em, em, empathetic and, and are passionate about causes, we often overstretch ourselves and put ourselves in this state of, you know, an anxiety sometimes, like, oh my God, am, am I not contributing to this movement? Am I not doing enough on this particular issue? And then maybe there are climate change issues and you feel like, am I doing enough on that? And then there's, you know, so like, it's okay not to engage with this particular issue. And it's okay to just, you know, by doing your work and doing it better, you might actually be making more of a change than sort of putting stuff on social media and signing petitions just for the sake of it. I, I'm always wary because I feel like with, with movements, especially when they are sudden and, and take, kind of take over the world, a lot of people don't follow through. And so like if the Black Lives, Lives Movement kind of dies down um, a little bit in terms of like the protests and so on, most people for the, for the most part will pretty much move on. And so for me, it's like, what's the point of that, right? If you're not going to fully engage with the issue, on a consistent basis, then there's no need to just jump on it just because that's what everyone's doing right now. So that's my take on it. Thank you so much for sharing. In the interest of time, I'm gonna ask the next two speakers to keep their responses just a bit shorter if, if possible. And that's uh, Liz and then uh, Kilza, if that's okay. That's if you still wanna speak. Hi everyone, <laughs> um, hope you can hear me. All right, so uh, I'm Liz, I'm from South Africa, but I'm currently in Ireland. Um, I'm working on an organization that teaches young girls and young black people as well, AI. Um, so I've got some points on what to do and what not to do. So this is what to share. And I know a lot of people have been setting up meetings with me personally to say, how can I be less uneducated about this topic? So my quick points for you. So what to do, uh, try to empathize and not sympathize. And I know that's gonna be very difficult because you can find it very difficult to relate to a topic that you aren't familiar with or you've never experienced. But how you can do that is maybe watching or edu um, educating yourself using the content from usually black authors, and that will help you with the empathy that you want to develop. And then try to use whatever weapon you have in your arsenal to fight for you know, minority groups, whether that be money, your voice, influence, um, and that's it. And then there's also some things not to do. So one of the things would be don't capitalize on people's emotions. Um, I know some people are now thinking about business ideas already, and they don't really care too much about what's going on with the people. And I know this, this is a hard pill to swallow and I don't mind being a little bit controversial, but it's helpful for some people. The second thing is try not play victim. Um, it's okay that we have the spotlight on a certain group of people. That's okay. It doesn't mean that tomorrow we're not gonna support you as well. So um, try your best to, to be okay not being in the spotlight. The third thing, try, uh, third and last thing actually, try not be subtly racist. <laughs> And I, again, in these meetings, a lot of people ask me, how can I not do that? So I'm gonna have a post and a list of people that aren't sure how they are adding to the problem. Um, and I, I'm sorry if that sounds terrible, but it'll be things like maybe when you're in an airplane, trying not to um, switch seats when you're sitting next to a black person or when you're in the shopping mall and a black person approaches and you swing your handbag or you, you check for your wallet. There's certain things like that that diminish the, the life of people. And so, um, you know, black people always feel uncomfortable where they are. So we want to make sure that everyone has some sort of quality of life. I think that it's very difficult to revolutionize the whole world in just a few months, but it's, it's, it's small actions like that that can help um, move, the, move the, the needle. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I think Kelza might be the last contributor, just because of time. All right. Thank you so much for uh, this discussion and for opportunity to contribute to this discussion. I think it's very timely and relevant to what is going on around the world. 
Just for introduction, I'm called Kiza Hussein, originally from Uganda, though living in Rwanda. I'm the founder of the SHK Law, Attorney's Law Firm, you know, uh, fighting for justice, but also working on the youth and leadership entrepreneurship programs. Well, uh, recently I've been uh, attracted to join into this conversation and, uh, and also have this conversation with people I've not always had this conversation with. And those are friends that are uh, of different color. Uh, we were talking about how everyone is now awakening and you know trying to, to be responsive and show solidarity with the Black Lives Matter, which I understand it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. But also we had an interesting discussion about how also whites feel uh, racism when they're in Africa. If you, are, if you are someone from East Africa, you know this word called umzungu, umzungu. Whenever there's a white tourist or white person coming this side, they always hear this word muzungu, people calling their, themselves, rather calling them as muzungu. And when I was having this discussion with this friend of mine who is from Austria, she told me actually that word is racist to them. And that we had never had it in that way because we never had this kind of discussion. So for them, for us, when people say it, we feel it's okay because we recognize them as white. Muzungu actually means white person. But it also att attracts some other kind of fair unfairness in a manner that when you're called Muzungu, you tend to have unfair prices of everything you buy because they think you have a lot of money, you're privileged and all that. So what I can say about what we can do maybe in order to perhaps contribute to this discussion, maybe finding lasting solution to this, is having uh, open-minded and constructive discussion on this subject. There are people we've not been having discussion because it makes us uncomfortable. You know, having talk about race and racism most of people from different uh, background and different color. So by talking about it, it will open up a door for us to have an understanding on what makes us feel maybe victim of racism or perpetrators of racism. Uh, the, also, just to, to mention something brief as I wrap it up. This person also told me that uh, she was going to join a campaign that was you know, in the awakening of this uh, racism and, and campaign about Black Lives Matter. And when she told the parents that I'm going to join, would you love to come along so that we show solidarity around the world? Then the parents were like, come on, there's nothing you're gonna change. There's nothing you're gonna change. There's no racism here. What, what, are you, what impact do, will you have on that? Then uh, when we had a discussion, I was like, well, it might seem that by you showing solidarity, maybe it has little impact because you feel racism is not in your family or in your society. But we also have to uh, remember what uh, Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. If you stand still and see injustice being committed and you just say, okay, it's far away from me, then at one point that injustice will come to your door, to your door and no one will be there to stand for you or to speak up for you. So it's, it's necessary that we stand in solidarity with everywhere, uh, everyone who is fighting for injustice everywhere. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kilsa, for, for sharing that. Uh, folks, just because of time, I mean, as, as we said at the start, we've only got an hour. Uh, if you want to share something, so Emma, I saw your hand, but unfortunately, just because we're out of time, feel free to still message in the chat. And, and even when we move on from the discussion, you can still say what you want to say in the chat and provide value that way. Thanks so much for all your responses. I mean, in summary, someone asked a question, and I think, you know, we're all young leaders, which means we have some people following us somewhat. And I think immediately when things like this happen, the impulse can be to share to millions online. But when we do that, sometimes we negate the hundreds we have within our immediate vicinity. So as Nicholas said, um, you know, if you want to work behind the scenes, do that and reach out to your immediate community. Um, and, and, you know, G made a point about agonizing about how to, uh, you know, how to really do this properly. I think sometimes when we're agonizing about how to solve a pro uh, how to re re respond to a problem, we're not agonizing about how to solve a problem. And oftentimes that, that's where we miss the mark a little bit. So quick two points, uh, or two examples rather. We all know that sy systemic change, the, the way you, you, you have a systems change, is it's always gonna be multi-leveled and multi-varied. You know, you have someone like John Boyega, who is a Star Wars uh, uh, actor, very famous, uh, you saw him on the on the front line marching and, and and really emoting, and that helped a lot of people. I have friends, folks I mentor, who messaged me about how that that really helped them uh, understand things in a way they've never done before. So 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 his march did that for them. 
then you have someone like Kanye West who didn't say anything online, but then has just donated 2 million to, to, to all sorts of different black colleges and, and, and he's really thinking about systemic change that way. Those are two different approaches at solving the same problem that will ultimately achieve the same outcome, which is, which is as Martin Luther King said, a day where we are all treated based on the content of, of our character, not the color of our skin. So, so thank you for, for contributing to this discussion. I'm gonna pass on to Izzy, who's gonna move us along. Yes, thank you, Mike. Um, that was a really interesting discussion um, on the uh, challenges that we're all facing at the moment. And you, you, those of you who spoke raised some really interesting points around the, the tension between us trying to have the answers right now and everyone's just trying to really make sense of what's going on. So what I wanted to do was kind of pose a question around what the gaps are that we're seeing at the moment. And for those of us who um, you know, identify with a black or minor minority ethnic community of any kind, um, you may have many people in your network um, who maybe wouldn't normally be asking you questions about this issue. Um, what can they do to become a better ally? What can they do to um, really fly the flag, like we're saying, beyond simply posting online? Um, and for those of you who are outside of the community, it may be the first time or a time that has really brought to the fore the fact you don't feel fully equipped to have these conversations and you don't really know where to get the information you need. So what I wanted to put out to the group now was what are the gaps uh, that you see in terms of the support or the resources that you think you need in order to take this conversation forward in a way that you know, you know, leads to the action that we all want to see? Um, it could be specific resources to help you build your knowledge or understanding, um, or it could be support from organizations and institutions of various kinds that can help you um, achieve your impact or forward your mission in a particular way. So does anyone want to put their hand up in terms of this, the gaps that they see at the moment and how best we could solve them? Yeah, so one thing that I would say is just one thing that I've seen that's happening is just being able to raise the awareness and talk about your story. Um, I know some people may say that, oh, when you're talking about your story, you can kind of victimize it. But I think it is really important for people to understand how personal racism is to people in the black community that have experience. And I think sometimes when you see like you feel like it's so far away and you don't understand that maybe someone that you know has experienced racism, you can't really empathize and understand. But when you know that it's actually the everyday things, it's not being called the N-word in your face. It's not being avoided on a plane. It's like the little microaggressions about when you have your Afro out, for example, like I like to wear wigs, and I like to change my hair and you have your Afro out and they're like, oh, they want to touch your hair. Like that's microaggression. You know, that's something that, you know, is not acceptable because it makes you feel like, like it's not normal. So I think being able to, people to actually give the platform to black people that you know and just listen to them, just listen to them, understand what they've personally experienced and what you can do with them in your community on your friendship to move forward to support them and being an ally. So I think raising awareness is really important. That's a really good point, Sarah. And um, I think it was Nicholas that um, said earlier that there's a kind of um, a, a tension at the moment between those of us who are just doing the work that we do behind the scenes um, and people maybe more recently who are um, being very kind of performative, I think was the word you used, Nicholas, on social media, but not necessarily kind of um, you know, having a track record of doing things um, as well. So. Um, it'd be really interesting to hear from those of you who have initiatives that you've been doing for a while now about the kind of support you think that you've lacked in order to take the mission forward um, and how, you know, what's happening at the moment, the increased awareness might actually um, do something to affect that. Um, but um, thank you, Sarah, for that. I think microaggressions are a real a real challenge and it's something that um you know before we had a word for it a lot of us felt like we experienced that and we felt that maybe we were it was all in our heads sometimes um because it's kind of that kind of thing it's not overt but it still affects us in various ways um gee i know you you put a message in the chat that i wanted to read out if i can just scroll back up to it you asked about how we feel about donating to charities and of course there are many interesting charities at the moment which people are donating to who work with um, you know, black people of various um, backgrounds and countries around the world. And lots of people are seeing this as an opportunity to donate. 
Um, but there is also the tension around whether seeing donating to charities at the moment is a perpetuation of white supremacy, like you're saying, and perpetuating the kind of narrative about uh, black people being dependent um, and you know, uh, you know, desiring handouts. Um, and for those of us who work in the entrepreneurship space, um, you know, I have friends who are saying at the moment, hey, some of the same organizations that I asked to partner with me or to sponsor me or to invest in my company are now saying that they're giving money to charity rather than actually you know, giving money to charity, should we not actually be investing in black businesses? Should we not actually be using it as an opportunity to buy from black businesses and therefore kind of increase uh, financial inclusion in our society rather than you know, uh, perpetuating this handout culture? Um, G, I don't know if you wanted to unmute and say a bit more about kind of the specific, um, the specific uh, experiences that led to that question. Oh yeah, so um, I am very, I'm a huge advocate for business and entrepreneurship um, and social enterprise and that's what we're trying to do with EcoBricks at the moment. But I had a conversation with a friend and he has got um, very frustrated, very upset about the Black Lives uh, Matter movement and he just said that it perpetuates this idea that, you know, um, uh, about white supremacy and uh, blacks being dependent and oh poor African as opposed to yeah as you say lifting up and supporting black business and I think I would personally prefer to help support a black entrepreneur or a black business as opposed to donate to charity. Charities are really important obviously we are a charity ourselves um, but I just want to get other people's perspective on that. Mm -hmm. And Emma, I know you've, you've said in the chat that um, your, your kind of view would be that the call was to donate to the specific black, black led causes that champion Black Lives Matter, um, as opposed to the charities that maintain the status quo. Um, and so it'd be, it'd be great if anyone um, else in the group, feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, if we can't see you raising your hand, um, wanted to kind of comment from that, from their perspective about running an organization that focuses on these issues. I think sometimes people are afraid of looking a particular way, worried about perception of receiving donations. Um, like what he said is fueling the perception of white per supremacy, which I would argue white supremacy is not a perception, it's a reality. Um, and being a poor black dependent charity case. Uh, I think that it has to be contextualized and we have to understand that if we're in a race, um, white people have started closer to the finish line than black people because of um, profiting from colonialism and the slave trade. And that has to be recognized. So it's not that we have made ourselves charity cases. It's that we've started so far behind and we've been kidnapped and stolen from and killed and not had the opportunity to amass wealth the way other people have. Um, so I, I really think that it has to be put in context um, and we have to remove the guilt around not needing help necessarily for ourselves, but needing to repair the situation. And that's why the conversation about reparations is so important. I completely agree with you. Um, and, you know, Ethel Hirsch is a, a UK based writer who's written a lot about the fact we're talking about this as a contemporary issue, but we really do need to trace back a lot of these challenges to you know the British Empire and the systematic um, uh, subjugation of African peoples and all of these issues that lead to where we are today. Um, so it's so important we look back and one of the books I've recommended in the um, GDOC is How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney, which is a fantastic book. Um, Liz, I know you had your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, sure. <laughs> so what I wanted to sort of it's a question, not really a comment. Um, we've had these discussions before with friends and it's always the, because when you live in a European city, you're, you're likely to see some ads of children, still today, children with flies around their faces with some sort of incurable disease or something that needs some sort of a donation. And I think coming here, I was, I was sort of kind of shocked that these ads are still up. Not because it's not happening, but because of the portrayal of Africa for some people that don't ever 
um, feel the need to go out and search more details about the development of Africa because there's been a lot of developments over the years. And so in my mind, I was just thinking that, yes, there are people that um, need food, need basic necessities, but there are also more people that need some sort of support because it usually, it usually filters down when you support um, a black business, they f it usually filters down into the community. So I really like the idea that someone just raised now that um, perhaps we should be looking at funding black businesses because black owners already understand that they want, they really have innately, they want to change their communities. They want to add value. And I think that that should, and it's not which cause is more important than the other, but rather can we develop over time how we support Africa and not always just support using food parcels. Thank you, Liz. Um, and you know, it is a really, it's a really big question. How do we actually support um, Africa, and um, not just Africa, but you know, the countries across the Caribbean? Um, I know that. Um, uh, forgive me. Who was it? so Lydia? You mentioned issues in Papua New Guinea, for example, um, is a real global issue. And I think, as an African diaspora, as a Caribbean diaspora, we all have a role to play in terms of um, changing the narrative. Um, I moved to Ghana eight months ago, for example, um, for that very reason. Um, Kiza, I know you had your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself? All right. Thank you so much for once again an opportunity to contribute. Well, uh, I may have perhaps. Uh, divergent views on, on whether to support uh, charities or uh, rather fund black, more, rather black businesses. Uh, I think personally that it could be either way. You know, it goes back to what you think is right. There's no, I think there's no uh, conclusion on, on what works. Either charities don't contribute towards our societies or supporting black business is the right thing. But I think it also goes back to uh, what is the perhaps the objectives or the mission of that charity. There are, I know that many charities around the world which are supporting uh, social enterprises, which are in black communities. And these social enterprises, they also generating money uh, and stuff and uh, rather empower people, young people to run their own enterprises. And that's what we're talking about, empowering people, empowering communities. Uh, well, as supporting a black business, it's a direct link between you who is funding or who's sponsoring with that business that you want to sponsor. There it may be you can have one-on-one -on -one accountability, what is the impact that is being created, how you progress, you can see all that. And in charities, it's all over, it's, it's always beyond your, your, your supervision. Maybe you just feel like they're doing the right thing and you want to contribute to it and it's a, it's a great thing to do. So it always goes back to you personally, what do you think is the right thing for you to do? Uh, well then if you, uh, if you ask me also general on what I would say about charities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, sponsoring business, I think I would also resonate with some people are saying maybe uh, by just donating, you know, having handouts to black business or black initiatives, it's more like uh, we are still undergrading ourselves. We feel like we are always on receiving end rather than being on a round table where we're all equals. And as long as we still think that we are always on the receiving end, we always have a, uh, we're always on the lower side of gaining power, and we always, you know, face this kind of injustice. So it's necessary that Thank also you. we create an environment where we we sit on a round table and say what is good for us and what can you contribute rather than just dictating what we should be doing. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Kiza. Um, and we're running out of time for this section um, before we go into the reflection piece. Um, but I know, Mohammed, you had your hand up. You're joining us from Mauritius. If you can keep your answer very, very brief, um, do you want to unmute yourself now? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to join this uh, interesting uh, uh, session on racism, especially following what, uh, what is happening in the US. I think we need to find uh, ways how we can, uh, through uh, all the youth, especially the Queen's Young Leaders and uh, other youth, how we can raise more awareness, find ways, uh, how we can ra raise more awareness on, uh, on uh, humanity and uh, that uh, black people first. Uh, we, we need to, to uh, raise awareness that uh, we, there is nothing that we, we need to consider about color because we are all human 
and that uh, we uh, all have the same like uh, uh, blood color red so why there is that, that discrimination and uh, we we must uh, try uh, to see how we can uh, uh, teach all, uh, the world that uh, we, we, we must first uh, see that uh, uh, to rebuild that humanity which i believe has uh, lost a bit where people are uh, having that discrimination against uh, black people and that we are all equal Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mohammed. I completely agree on the need for all of us to recognise that we are all human and we are all sort of one people that needs to be working together to achieve change. Um, thank you so much for your contributions to, that, to this particular part of the discussion. What I really got from that is that on one level, we really need to understand how as people we um, continue to raise awareness and provide forums for people to have these conversations. And on, an, on another hand, we need to make sure that rather than just seeing this as an opportunity to invest in charities and you know, groups that uh, you know, work with black people in various ways, although that is very important, um, we should also be looking at the bigger picture around how we create gener generational wealth within black communities, how we increasingly buy from um, black businesses and allow uh, greater financial inclusion in our various societies. There was also a broader point about how us as an African diaspora can give back and contribute and make sure that we are using skills and talents that every single person right now in this room has to make sure we are uplifting people and creating the tools and the resources and the wealth uh, that we need for a better future. So thank you so much for that. And we'll go into the final part of the discussion, which is really, um, you know, five minutes or so to reflect on what's going on right now. And we have one or two big questions for you guys at the moment, which is, what is really different this time around? And do we really think that things are going to change? Feel free to unmute yourself or write your response in the chat? Yeah, so uh, what's going on around the world? Um, I really think this is um, a very big question for all of us that we really need to think about. Um, this is something that really started as, uh, I, I don't really think that everyone thought that things would get worse than that, like the way they are. Like they started as a joke and we all thought probably within two weeks or maybe one month, everything will be fine. Or maybe some of us, we even thought it won't come to maybe to the countries where we are. But then unfortunately, like it has spread everywhere and the whole world is at standstill. So one thing I really think, yes, things will change, but um, I'm really thinking it will be quite, quite hard like they're not going to change in a minute and go back to normal and stabilize so they're going to change gradually but during this gradual process um i think we really need to think about like everything we really need to think about how we are going to conduct our projects as I think about our careers as people so i really think we really just need to think about what what next in this due process whereby things are going to open up slowly by slowly what you can exactly do as a need be to you thank you perfect thank you so much diana and i know that uh kevin you've written a uh, kelvin sorry you've written um a really interesting post um around conversations that are happening in a bubble and i encourage everyone in the group to read in the chat um kelvin's view um around Black Lives Matter and you know how we get a more positive um, interaction um, to ensure that we have lasting change. Um, we have uh, we have sort of a few more people that have raised their hand. I'm going to prioritise Daniel and Emily um, and then hand over um, to uh, the Queen's Commonwealth Trust to um, uh, sort of round off our conversation. So Daniel, do you want to unmute yourself and, and tell us your thoughts? I'm, I'm happy uh, to be part of this discussion. I'm Daniel. I run uh, an organization as a, the executive director, CE Andrew with Advocates for Nature. Regarding the racism that we're expressing around the world, I think uh, it's, it will be more important if we focus on empowering the young generation in Africa economically. 
when you look at uh, most of the cases of racism, they are based on um, the financial weakness of the African continent. Because someone thinks you can uh, sustain yourself, uh, they think they can deprive you, they will give you work, you work overtime, they will treat you the way they want. This a case in point, uh, most of the people in Africa here are suffering in the Arab Emirates. In fact, like uh, this is creating a lot of bias between the, the, the Western world and the, the African continent because we're losing life in the way you get a clip of someone being dropped from the an upper stair and dying on the ground, dropped by another fellow human. So just because someone thinks you don't have the money, you are in a foreign land to work, then they think they must take whatever advantage of you, what you're doing. So because the African continent is financially weak, they take advantage of that. Those who have the racist mind, not everyone has. Then uh, another issue I feel like would be important if we really found a way to start this sensitization about a, a solidarity in humanity, uh, like we started in the in the Western world. Uh, maybe, for example, it's it's more clear. I don't know if if this is from only for those people in Africa from Uganda. If we started build, creating awareness amongst the young children, like we teach them to learn uh, how to respect humanity. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, apologies, Emily. Um, we have run out of time. Um, I've just put a note in that if you do want to share your thoughts in the chat, please do. And we'll make sure that everyone can see them. Thank you so much um, for all of your thoughts on the topic. Um, thanks so much, Izzy, for that last discussion. This has been really fascinating for me just to see you know, how around the Commonwealth, um, you know, everyone's dealing with this issue or, or at least tr trying to deal with it. Um, I mean, at risk of, you know, <laughs> trying too hard to inspire, I think m m what's really important here for me is optimism. Um, I, I shared with the Queen's Commonwealth Trust that my little brother asked me a question that really got me thinking the last few days. He said, Mike, do you actually think, that, do you, do you actually think things will be, will be better this time? And he's very straight talking and he said that to mean, you know, we've had moments before, but are things gonna get better? And after doing some thinking, the, the one way I think things will get better is if we don't treat this as a moment and we commit long-term to learn. So even the resources we've been sharing, uh, my hope is that folks don't click on it, read it and go, well, that's that, and, and then move on. But they commit to lifelong learning. And my hope is that we don't donate to charities to absolve ourselves of moral guilt, but we commit to long-term partnerships with businesses that last you know, 10, 20, 30 years. It's about continuing in this vein and continuing in this passion and not having some moment that culminates with a donation. So I think if we all commit to long-term commitment to this cause, then millions and millions of people's lives will be made much better. And again, we're that step closer to, to the world we all want to live in. Really happy to have had this conversation and received so much of your thoughts. I think it's going to be really helpful for all of us moving forward. There's so much here to think about and digest and, and try to solve because we've raised a lot of issues. Um, and I think it's really easy in conversations like this one to walk away feeling like, well, that was that. <laughs> Feel horrible now. Life is horrible. Um, but kind of turning that into a new kind of energy and letting it propel us forward and thinking about what is possible. I think it's it, it, the future that we envision is not impossible. It just requires some cooperation and some community building, um, individual people coming together to work as a community. And we really need to work on community building. Um, I think Mike said optimism and recognizing that this is a moment in and of itself, but it's part of a trajectory and we decide through our actions how we move forward and where we end up.